Hi, I'm Rob Hardnett. On the Art of the Possible podcast, we aim to inspire, entertain, and educate you in all areas of leadership and leading a life full of possibility. We speak with people who inspire by their actions and their attitudes and cover a wide range of personal and business topics that are relevant for today. The Art of the Possible podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, the John Maxwell Team, Extended Disc Behavioral Assessments, and Selling Strategies International. You can find out about all these brands and more at robhardnett.com. And now, let's get on with the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, pretty excited this week on The Art of the Possible. I'm coming to you with an amazing guest, an amazing guest all the way from Austin, Texas. Can you believe it for The Art of the Possible? Mr. Tim Novak. How are you, Tim? I'm doing fantastic, Rob. Super excited to be with you today. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you along. We've had a lot of chats over the years and uh, we've met, met a few times in person, a lot of times through Zoom more recently, haven't we? More of our virtual look, but uh, it's been great to have you on. Hey, look, I was looking at, um, at your business and one of the things I've always loved was your tagline uh, for, uh, for, for Novak Development. And we'll talk about um, development and leadership and a whole bunch of stuff, but your um, tagline, which was be in, be real, be bold. I love that. But tell me, how, how did you come up with that? Where, where, how does that sort of line to your values or where did that come from? No, that's a great question. And that that takes me way back. In fact, it takes me back before I was married, Rob. Um, You know, growing up, I I was one of these kids that was more reserved, introverted, didn't have a lot of self-esteem, played sports, but didn't get a lot of uh, uh, credit. And when I met my wife, it actually took me two months to convince her to go out with me. And um, I begged and she finally let me go out. And when she did, she said, <laughs> I could, she, uh, she said, I could, I, I could go to her high school choir concert. So when the guy wants a girl, what's he do? He goes. And, uh, the same night I told her, I loved her, um, shows you the kind of self-esteem I had. She was like, you don't even know me. You're crazy. Well, I just, I knew. And over a few weeks, I found out that her parents wouldn't let her go out with anybody unless they were still in high school. I was out. And when her dad found out I was out of high school, I couldn't go out with her on the weekend unless she had oh, a date wow. with somebody else. And if she did, I could go out with her. And when the guy wants the girl, what's he do? He helps her find another date. And over about a two year period, we made arrangements to get married. Uh, she had the dress, the ring, the engagement uh, invitations, all that stuff. And I got cold feet. I'd been listening to guys at work say, what do you want to screw up your life and do something like get stupid, like get married? And you know what? They were right. I listened to them. I canceled the wedding. It was devastating. And within a couple of weeks, I realized I screwed up. I made a mistake. I called her back and said, hey, let's elope. I made a, I made a bad decision. So we met with her parents, told them we were eloping and her dad, the guy that said, hey, you can't do this unless you do that. He set me down around the kitchen table and he asked me several questions. And of course, when the guy wants the girl, what's he do? He answers yes to all the questions, right? So we got married. <laughs> right. Uh, we got married. Uh, she was still a high sc- in high school. Um, she went to school on Monday after we got married. I went back to work and within 30 days, she called her dad and said, I want an annulment. Tim's not the guy wow. that I thought I married. And he said, you're not coming home. I'll call Tim. And I'll never forget that call. He said, you remember when we were sitting around that kitchen table and I asked you those questions? He said, you're at a crossroads in your life right now. One decision leads to default and destruction and the other leads to success and sustainment. I'm challenging you to honor your commitment to those questions. And had I not had a leader in my life, stand up to me at that point and challenge me to get all in, all into everything that I'm going to do, every decision I make to make a conscious decision to get all in and be real about who I am and what I want, not what others want or what I think they want. And to be bold enough to stand up and say, I am going to do this. This is how I'm going to do it and make a conscious decision. Had I not made that decision, that was over 41 years ago, I made that decision to get all in to everything I do in my life. So whether it's business, family, life, sports, or this call today, I wouldn't be here had I not had someone challenge me to get all in. 
and to be real with who I am and to be bold enough to do things that maybe others aren't willing to do. So that's how I got my tagline that started me in my business years ago. And it's just kind of developed and been a part of who I am so um, with all my clients. How long have you been married now? Uh, uh, it, about 41 and a half years. So that is amazing. <laughs> and and I, I want to know that when you had that sit down, I mean, the second sit down, when, when you had the leader in your life of her father um, talk to you, how old were you then? 20, let's see, that was, uh, I was 21. 21. Yeah. That's, that's 21. 20, you know, so that's um, kind of, that's kind of dating me now, isn't it? 21, 41. No, no, that's, pro that's providing you with, <laughs> 62. That's providing you with so much wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, who put this, this out, you know, Tim does look, look that age, you know, he's, he's, he looks mid forties. I reckon I'd tell you mid forties, Tim, I, I'd, I'd say, and I don't know, if, we've never had a discussion on your age, but I've always thought that that's a wonderful story, but just at such an early age to have that, to be all in, but what's more important about that, you can have a discussion, but you did something about it. Um, because he could say that as a leader and, and you've got to be ready for that conversation as well. You're plenty of young guys at 21 and probably including myself. Um, uh, and I look back now, I got married at 27, which to me is it's this, this day and age, Tim, isn't it? It's amazing. It's, it's crazy. People are like, what are you doing? Are you, who are you people? Um, uh, you're getting married that age, but I don't know, 21 where, where I was ready for that that kind of discussion to have that and, and to be all in. I love that because it's about intentionality. It's saying, you know, I'm going a hundred percent or I'm not doing it at all. And, and I'm, you know, you and, I, you and I kind of talk a lot about that. We're very similar like that. We're either going to do it and we're not doing it. And if we do do it, then we're doing it. But I love that. The other thing it taps into, uh, which I know you're a big believer is authentic. So authentic leadership, which is, you know, something I think we're, we're, we're missing a lot of today. Uh, and what are your thoughts on authentic leadership and sort of where you, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, what are your thoughts? Dude, I, I, and again, I see it all the time and I go back to my mentors and I just shared with you, my father-in-law was an amazing mentor and, and he was a actual professional speaker himself. And I learned so much from him and, and he shared five things with me that have stuck with me, Rob, and every leader I look at, I kind of, I kind of look at them through this lens. And the first thing that he really taught me, if I want to be not just a, not an average, not a good, not a great leader. If I want to be a world-class leader in whatever I'm doing, he shared with me five things. The first one was be an example. You know, John talks about, you know, the law of the picture is people do what people see. Um, when leaders show the way with the right actions, then followers copy them and they succeed. So for me, it's all about modeling the vision. So I'm constantly looking at leaders and go, okay, are they being an example? Are they walking the talk? Or are they just talking the walk? So for me, that's the first key is, are they being an example? The second thing, is that to be an effective leader, and I tell you, I, I, I made some mistakes with this even as a young leader. The second key he taught me was that in order to be world-class, you have to show them how. You can't tell them what to do. If you're leading people, you have to show them how. So John Maxwell says, be a river, not a reservoir. It's not about you taking in everything and looking good because you know more. It's, hey, take them by the hand, show them those that you're working to lead and pour into people every day. So pass on to them the things that, that, that will allow them to achieve more than you have. So again, I'm looking at leaders and going, Hey, are they showing the people that are near them, especially those in their inner circle? Are they really influencing them by sharing and showing them the way? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Cause I, one thing I talk about is that leadership is <clears throat> a visual sport, right? And this is a visual sport because whether you're modeling the way the right way or you're modeling whatever you're doing, you're modeling the way, right? So I think that's, and you and I, we interpret that as modeling the right way. Well, there's a lot of people who model the right. wrong way and then expect their people to do something else. Uh, so, yeah. so I think that's really great. And I think the other thing 
I think I'm seeing leaders do now, and this has been called out during COVID, which I think is a good thing, is that oftentimes you're seeing leaders not leading, like they're saying, oh, I'm going to hand it to my people. You guys come up with the vision uh, and, and I'll follow you. You guys do this. You can, I want you guys to think about it. They're almost being sometimes a bit too consensus, but even if someone wants to do it, um, they might have the will to do it, but they don't have the skill to do it. So the leader's going to take yeah. the first step, which I love your second point, which is around, they're going to show the way. They don't have to say it's my, it's only my way and it's my way of the highway, but they do have to show this is mm -hmm. what my vision is. This is what I think lead the way firstly. So I love those first two. Give me the third one. Yeah. So excited. the third one is, and it kind of fits in with what, right? The leader has to share the vision. Yeah. Might not have, might not have clarity on what those steps are, right? But if you understand your team and you lean into the strengths of your team, then the third point is, hey, meet their needs. What is it that they need from you to move them to action? Because if you can't touch them, really, emotionally, John says, hey, you know, leaders touch a heart before they ask for a hand. If, you're, if you don't connect with them, you can't move them unless you can touch them with emotion. So good leaders work at connecting with others all the time. And yeah. I love this. I love this, uh, this, uh, Glenn Jackson. I met Glenn, uh, a few years ago at a John Maxwell event. And, and, and he said something to me that really stuck is that leaders impress leaders impress at a distance, but they impact up close. And unless you're in tune share the vision and really in tune with what's going on with your team and the strengths of your team and let them know that you're leaning into their strengths. You might not have how to get there, but the team, the team comes up with ideas. So I just, for me, yeah. that, that resonates so much with what, what you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, um, you need that lead. And if they're, if they're bought in, I think that's always a great one, you know, so especially with times of change, you know, and I use that acronym, um, it's, 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 it's a lesson from John, but I, I put it into an acronym. So it's probably part John, part me somewhere. But, and, and I use it this one, it's UCOP, which is, you know, do, do they understand the change? Have they contributed to the change? Do they feel they own the change? And the test is, can they pass it on? Yeah. Right. That's the ultimate oh. test as a leader, you know, and I, and I call it UCOP, UCOP. And I love that because that's, it's so important. Well, do they understand it? Well, what's your evidence of that? And as coaches, that's the sort of questions we ask as coaches. Oh do yeah. They understand what's your evidence? Did they contribute? Well, yeah, I sent an email. Well, hang on a second. <laughs> well, they read my email. Did that contribute? Well, that's not kind of what I meant. Uh, do they feel they own it? Well, how do you, how do you really know they owned it versus we, we have to do it because, you know, we're kind of level one leadership. You got a better job title than I am. So I'll do it versus I'm excited. When well, you see the, the teams really embrace it, feel it's part of theirs, and they start passing it on. You just, you just, you can high five at that point because you know that they're, yeah. they're bought in. They're totally bought in. Totally yeah. bought in. What's number Love four? That, number four, expect a lot as leaders. Teams succeed or fail based on the team's commitment. You just talked about that, right? The more buy in they've got, the more they collaborate. Hey, they buy in, their commitment to one another and the team is stronger. But as a leader, it's expecting a lot from them, right? Not, not pushing them and telling them, but what you see they're capable of achieving and helping them understand that every seat on the bus counts, right? I mean, yeah. it's so important. Every member on that team knows how important their position is, not as a threat, but how relevant they are to the success of the organization. So that to me... The leader has to set the expectations and the team needs to know that that leader expects a lot out of them. I, I'd love that one, Tim. People, um, we talk about the power of a catalyst. You hear John's teamwork one talks about the, you know, the, have you got a catalyst, heavy catalyst you have on your team? Uh, and what I've learned also is that sometimes the leader needs to prod the catalyst a little bit. Sometimes the catalyst is there, but they haven't maybe put their hand up. Right. And uh, I remember many years ago doing a yachting regatta and, uh, I was my, my good, good friend who owned the boat. He was ill. And he said to me, ran me during the week. He said, I can sail, but, but I need, can you organize the boat, organize the crew? And I was okay. Make a few phone calls, make sure everyone was right. And he said, and we had a very, very uh, professional, basically semi-professional uh, helmsman who was steering the boat, uh, very big reputation, world champion. And he said, give him a call. And I knew him, but he said, give him a call and uh, just make sure he's on if he needs anything. So I rang him. 
and I remember ringing him, speaking to him, and this this guy, you know, who I you know, he just thought it was who was amazing. I was so excited just to be on the boat with this guy. Said to me, "Okay, so got that. We're gonna have him there. This guy's gonna do this. I want you, I want you to do uh, main sheet and tactics with me." I gotta tell you, Tim, uh, the phone went silent at my end because. <laughs> I was like, I was thought I just made it on the boat and he was asking me to control the biggest sail and to do tactics with him. And, said, and he goes, you're okay with that, aren't you? And I'm like, yes. I'm like, you, I mean, I'm all in. I go, yes. And afterwards I'm like, I'm <laughs> three days of like, just like, I started weather charts for three days. I just, I, I went just all in, you know? And, and I'm taking on that role and it was so exciting and, and we won that race and it was, it was just exciting. But what I learned from that was his ability um, to, he knew there was something there in me, but I kind of didn't think I was ready to step up. I didn't think yeah. on that boat, I was the right person. And he prodded me and I did. And from then onwards, it was just such an empowering thing. And I think that's what you mean by that. They, you know, they've got a, he, he demanded a lot, right? He demanded a lot from yeah. me. And, uh, but I was also ready more than, more than ready. It turned out to, to do that. And I knew what to do. I just had not been prodded into that at that point. Yeah. So good leaders, I think good leaders prod too. And they find catalysts. I love that. I love that. When I think back is a lot of the, a lot of the growth is because someone challenged me a lot of times by not waiting until I asked for the opportunity, but saying, Hey, here, jump. And, and you find a way you just yep. find a way. So that's a, that's a great, great uh, quality. So fantastic, man. That's awesome. What's number awesome. five. Oh, I love it. And it kind of, it just kind of flows with what we're talking about here is that in order to really influence people to a higher level, you got to believe in them. You have to believe in them. You've yeah. got to make whoever you are with feel like they're the most important person in the world. And, you know, that everything you give them is an investment. So as a leader, that's a different approach. Looking at everything I give the people that report to me that I'm working to lead is an investment in them. So I have to let them know I value them and use the words, I know you can do it. And that was one of the things my father-in-law shared with me that day he called me. My wife wanted right. annulment. After he said, I'm challenging you, you're at a crossroads. He said, I know you can do it. But it's such a small thing. But doesn't everyone, doesn't, don't we all want somebody to say, hey, I believe in you. I know you can do this. So, yeah, and when it's done with that tone and authenticity as opposed to a sign off on an email, you got this, <laughs> which means nothing, frankly. So don't do it. It's a lesson to people out there. But when you do it with sincerity and authenticity, you know, I know this. Here's some evidence of where you've done it in the past. And I'm sure he probably did that, Tim, but uh, where they bring up something, go, well, you, you got through this, you did this before. Uh, remember that time. A leader sometimes has to do that. To we get ourselves to think, actually, I did do that. I. Um, I did actually have a growth mindset uh, during that particular period. I've kind of forgotten. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, I can go back and the muscle memory kicks in, but you do that leader. And it's even better when the leader does that because, you know, you know, the leader remembers me, remembers the conversation, remembers something we did in the past and, and knows I can do it. And they've got evidence of it. They're not just saying it. That's a really strong point. I think that's, that's, a, that's a great one. I, 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 you remind me of a very interesting story, um, Tim. I'll, I'll talk about it because I think the other quality of that leader to do that the leader has to uh, be able to intentionally listen and be a good listener. And I, I, this is a story I've not told in the podcast before because it involves my wife. Um, and you won't, you probably won't, this is a crazy story because it's going to get into our guitar story in a second. Um, and that is this, that my wife and I had the, uh, had, had the great privilege of going along to a small group of people on, a, you know, it was a marketing, a marketing conference in Melbourne in Australia but mm. the guest speaker was, I think, one of the greatest direct marketers ever who doesn't get much credit for it. And that's Gene Simmons from Kiss. Oh. And Gene <laughs> Simmons invented direct marketing in, in, in the music business, you know, back, back in the 70s. Now, he was speaking. But, um, and Gene's a very, very tall man, you're very charismatic. And 
they got to a situation where um, Gene spoke for so long. If you go to a Gene Simmons concert, it's 45 minutes. Uh, Gene's going to actually talk. He'll, 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 go, he'll go for 90. He gives you value. I can tell you that. And they, so we were, anyway, my wife I said, yeah, I'd like to ask Gene this question because our youngest son at the time, our youngest son was fascinated with, with, with Kiss and the whole Kiss and what they were doing and the whole makeup of the band and the whole thing. So she wanted to say, say something to, to, to Gene. And there were a bunch of people around Gene Simmons. I uh, wanted to talk to her, wanted to talk to him. And so when she kind of got close to him um, in, and he turned around and she said, she's never experienced anything like it, except with me, Tim, just put that out there. Um, she said, <laughs> he turned around and she said, his eyes went straight connected. And he just had, even though she said we were surrounded probably by 30, 40 people, Jean just blocked out everybody and just focused a hundred percent on her. And had this beautiful, she said, fantastic conversation about um, the topic she was talking about. And he was intently listening. And she knows he was intently listening because he talked about the fact. He, in fact, Gene was so excited because it was intergenerational. And he realized that he, was, he couldn't believe he was impacting kids under five. And of course, Gene's such a marketer. He, was, he said the cogs. She said, I yeah. can see the cogs in Gene going around thinking, what other Kiss product could we do? This is a whole new market. But she said, even though there's a lot of people around, all sort of wanting to get his attention. He was a hundred percent like just looking in her eyes, just really paying attention. And she felt there was just this direct, she said it was the most amazing experience. And then they finished the conversation and said goodbyes. And then he would, and he switched his eyes to, to, to the next person. But she said, it was, it was so rare. And I'm sure you've had that with, with some people who can really do that. I've only had it <clears throat> maybe 10 times. I really recall in my life where someone is really intentionally listening and not being distracted. And it's kind of rare today in the era of social media and electronic yeah. devices, isn't it? So I think to me, a leader has got to be able to listen with intent and, and authentically. No, absolutely on point. And I, I love kiss one of my favorite bands <laughs> growing up. And I, I like you, you met, you met Gene. I met Paul Stanley oh, wow. uh, in Houston, Texas, uh, like back in 1976 without his makeup on. And it was like, oh, really? that's incredible. I wouldn't recognize him <laughs> unless I happened to be in a guitar store and he was there too. But uh, I just, I love that story. And it reminds me of, of, of an encounter that I had with John Maxwell uh, about two years ago. I had an opportunity to introduce him at one of his IMCs. And I, it's one of the things that you get an opportunity to do being on the team. And in the process I went through to do that was incredible, by the way, just to prepare. Don, John doesn't like long introductions. So it was like two and a half, three minutes was the most. Took me about a month and like seven videos and submittal and all of that. And here I was. Let me stop you there, Tim, because I just want yeah. to bring people up to speed with this because I think this is a wonderful story is that you were – going to introduce John. And as I said, John doesn't like long introductions. He wants to get on with his people. Um, you, it was like two to three minutes of introduction, but yeah, you did a month of like rehearsal for that with videos, with a coach, with a speaking coach. Yeah. Right. So I just love that preparation for that because why is that important? I, I think that's, you know, I think I, I, and you're a great speaker anyway, like straight off the bat, you're going to be good. Um, but that extra bit that went into that, you know, what was the, what, tell me, tell us about that. Keep going with this story. Yeah, that's a, that in itself was amazing. Right. And you, you, you've probably heard the, the story that our speaking coach teaches us that, Hey, if you've got 10 minutes to speak, you need two weeks to prepare. Yeah. If you've got an hour, you're ready now because anybody can talk for an hour off the cuff. But when you think about, you've got two and a half minutes there's a difference in need to know and nice to know. So I had to prepare and refine that message and really think about the impact that individual had made on my life so that in that two minutes, I connected with the audience yeah. and it, it re resonated with them and it was delivered in a way that didn't look like, hey, I just walked on stage and... <laughs> Did it off the cuff, right? Yeah, so right. <laughs> it was unbelievable. The process was unbelievable. So again, yeah. it's one of those, hey, if you're going to get all in, it's there's a lot more to it than what you see up there in two minutes. 
Yeah, there's a lot. And that, that gave me such an insight. Um, and you know, but it, it gave me the insight, but it also didn't surprise me too much because of the level of professionalism of, of John Maxwell and the team. I know it wouldn't have been a surprise to you. You wouldn't have gone, are you kidding, Ruddy? I'm not doing a month. I'm already good. You would have gone, I get it. I get it. Where do I start? And I, you know, it reminds me of this, um, this, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the Rolling Stones in concert, the, the last concert they, they recorded with Martin Scorsese. Um, it was in New York, but if you haven't seen it, go watch it because it's a really interesting part. Uh, from ba- Here's the story, and I could be wrong on the starting date, but basically since about 1964 to this day when the Rolling Stones play live, Mick will not announce what the first song is till literally five to six minutes before they go on. And in the video, Scorsese is going nuts with Mick, going, Mick, I need to know. He says, I'm not telling you. And he says, I need to, Mick, I've got lighting, I've got people, I want to do different things for different songs. You've got to tell me what you're opening with. He says, I won't tell you. I will tell you when I'm ready, Martin. You've worked with me for a long time. You know how I am. And the point is that what Mick does is he is, he's, he, he's behind the curtain. He sometimes walks the aisles of the concert, just getting the vibe of the audience. He looks at what the economy is doing in the local region where, it's pl- where he's playing. So do I come on with Start Me Up or do I do a do Jumping Jack Flash? What do they need? And they spoke to Keith Richards about it. And Keith goes, you think Martin's got a problem? I got to hit the first string. He never tells me either. <laughs> That's a great line. And he says, well, I'm just used a- to it. I know the songs. And we will come out and we're doing Jumping Jack Flash. Right. And that uh, is incredible. But it's so important to get that first bang out of the gate. And that's essentially, you know, um, I've not spoken to Roddy about that, but essentially that's what they were doing with you. So you came on with just unbelievable. And uh, there's another sh- short story. We could go for two hours here, Tim, but there's another short story I was watching with ZZ Top. Now you would know ZZ Top. You know, I wouldn't have to say for Texas boy, I say ZZ Top. And they, they, they actually opened many years ago, before the beards, they opened for the Rolling Stones in Hawaii. And Dusty Hill was on, yeah, doing his thing on the bass. And he was really excited to be for the Stones. He said one of the greatest moments of his life back way back then was he said, I somehow was looking at the crowd. It was going fantastic. They were the opening act for the Stones. And he said, for some reason, I felt this, I needed to look to my right. And I looked to my right and there was Mick in the back with the curtain slightly open going, thanks, That's buddy. Um, and he said, That's I just awesome. felt, I felt so good that we don't, we'd got it right for Mick. <laughs> but it's, it's, isn't it's that just that important part that we're all in and before the act, what happens? Before you come, what happens? And there's that preparation, um, which I think is another thing of great leaders is they, they prepare for, for things. They're thinking through plan A, B, C, D, E uh, before they come on. But we're going to talk a couple of things. Let me jump oh into things. Gosh. You had you had two amazing guitars in the background. I've got to ask you about that. So tell us about your music. Tell us about those guitars. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that's two you can see. I have I have multiples here in my in my I office. Those are just two that I have on the wall. And I, I think I've got uh, four in my office here. And hey, I, I grew up as a young musician, played the club scene when I lived in Houston, Texas, and bought I spent my money on expensive guitars and that's how I met <laughs> Paul Stanley. I met Billy Gibbons playing in a, oh, wow. in a, in a music store when they were just starting and yes. we were jamming in the back room, checking out amplifiers. That and was a pre beards. Cause they, they had the beards after that was so- pre that was pre beards. Yeah. yeah pre beards. And I actually lived right across the freeway from where their studio home was. They played in. So I spent a lot of my money on guitars and then I sold a lot of guitars to get money (laughs) and kept a few. And, um, my whole family's musicians. My brother-in-law is actually a musician has a studio here. I was his manager and shopped him in Hollywood for a few years. And pre COVID I'd put all my guitars away. Well, within the last six, seven months, I pulled them all out. I've had some worked on, uh, started taking lessons again and uh, moving from just playing rock music to learning how to play fingerstyle jazz. Yep. And uh, it's become something that I wouldn't be doing probably today had COVID not uh, been Isn't here. That amazing? I was wrapped up with other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am not a musician. Uh, my, my cousin had a guitar shop. Uh, so, and I love it. 
Um, now I have performed in some bands, Tim, but, I, but never as, as a musician. I've been forced to sing in some bands uh, doing some comedy yeah. and stuff over the years. So I, I kind of gave a glimpse of the scene. Um, but, but my wife and I, um, I know Lisa's uh, killing to meet you. It's a shame we, we, because we couldn't get to IMC this year in March to meet you. But uh, Lisa and I photographed bands through the 90s oh. locally. So we, I used to write the articles uh, on, the, on the nights and she would do all the photography work and we'd submit them to the club magazines and all that kind of stuff. And it was a just great way to meet, meet musicians, to hang out. To just, I just loved capturing a live moment. It was just something so magical. And we were shooting on film back then. So it was, uh, you know, it was tough. It wasn't like you had oh, yeah. to, all, all the motor drive going on digital. You know, you had to get the shots right. But it's, that's a great scene. So I'm, I'm so it's exciting for you to be back uh, getting those guitars out again because they are just works of art and be able to play them like you. I'm so, I'm so envious of you doing that. Um, you talk, we talked about your father in law as, as one of your mentors. Who else were mentors for you? Um, you know, maybe you just started to get in your business life as well. Who, who else were mentors as well for you? Yeah, I got to tell you, my father-in-law was such an influence. Uh, he helped start the American Speaker Association. I didn't realize, you know, how big he was in the speaking business in the Texas area until later in life. And he introduced me to Zig Ziglar. Um, and after I met Zig, it was like I read everything I could get my hands on. And I worked to emulate him and Earl Nightingale. So I bought tapes back then there was so yeah. many different cassette tapes i bought uh brian tracy uh nightingale and ziggler stuff and really worked on modeling my style as a speaker around them so yeah. those guys influenced me and really what 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 zig influenced in me resonated when i read your book because part of your force four step process is attitude and mindset yes. right yeah. and 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 zig instilled in me as a young leader that everything has to do with your attitude and your mindset and he and and he said it starts with the way you greet people from the way you answer the phone and you don't answer the phone hello you can answer the phone hello or hey or whatever he said you answer the phone hey it's it's a great day. Tim Novak speaking. Hey, good morning, Tim Novak. Good evening, Tim Novak. Who do I have the pleasure to be speaking to right now? That made such an impression on me that I said, every time I answer the phone, it's going to be good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hey, who do I have the pleasure of speaking to? This is Tim Novak. And it went, it, it, it was amazing. It's just amazing. The connection. Now, some people today go, Oh, I thought I got a, I thought I got your answering machine. When it's <laughs> reality, they're not expecting, Hey, good morning, Tim Novak. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking with? It puts them in a different frame of attitude and mindset. So that so resonated great. with me so much when I read your book with oh, what great. Zig teaches on attitude. So well, well done, but Hey, Zig. Um, yeah, Zig was. Dom, uh, I had the incredible. tapes. So like you, I had the tapes of Zig, and um, I was lucky enough. You know, being in Australia, a little bit, little out of the US, but I did get. To, I did get to meet Jim Rohn. Uh, Lisa and oh. I met Jim. Just fantastic operator, um, and you know Tony Robbins. I met and uh, had several correspondence in the early days of Tony, um, just around his mindset, and you know I think I mentioned it in the book there, and he was one of the reasons that um, I won the world championship. I did. And I met, I met Tony after that. I remember telling him his impact and he was genuinely really excited for me. He genuinely, he was like, he actually That's sat down awesome. with me and goes, tell me how you did it. Like what, what was the bit in the book? It was awakened the giant within was the book that it, I took him through the chapter part that really made the difference. You know, the phrase in the chat, he really wanted to know what that phrase was in, the, in which chapter in awaken the giant had kind of got me, um, psyched up to, get into it hey you you remind me of something there was a, a guy i worked with um when i was at hewlett packard and he used to on on weekends i didn't know this but on weekends he told me so it was a it was a saturday morning i rang him he rang me late friday night i couldn't get hold of him i thought i'll ring him back saturday morning so i ring him back i'm in my i'm on my car phone right in those days car phones and i was ringing my car phone on saturday morning and i ring back and i go and anyway it goes through and it just goes hey how you doing? It's, it's Anthony here. I can't take your call right now. Uh, I'm a little busy, but just leave your name and number and I'll call you back directly. <laughs> right. And I go, oh, well, got his voicemail. So I go, Hey, Anthony, it's Rob. And he picks up and he goes, Hey man, how you doing? I almost drove off the side of the road. I said, what are you doing? And he goes, Oh, sometimes if I don't know who it is, I just fake, I fake my voicemail. 
started. Well, are you going to work on the because that's not so good. I said, the first bit was quite good. He said, yeah, it doesn't worry. I just fake it. And if it's someone I want to talk to, I, I just pick it up. If someone or not, I just let them go. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> you got to pick that one up. That's the next one. Oh, Zig never my... taught me that, but that's what he was never taught you that. No. <laughs> Oh so I my think those, gosh. those, those mentors were, um, and the impact those guys had, you know, I just, that, that is global, isn't it? And what I love about those guys now, it's just still going, you, you can still sign up to Zig's material, Jim's material kind of on Instagram and their legacy, uh, is still going. And what I think their fundamentals are fundamentals, aren't they? So the, so the teachings that they do, and even what you just said then is so relevant, even today on a smartphone, even today, and, and weirdly enough in COVID, as we're doing more virtual stuff, it's even more relevant. Oh, so much more relevant. You're spot on. It's, uh, so people important. are learning to uh, sell virtually. Now, I, I, mean, I, I know some of my clients are doing, you're probably running workshops and I've done a few on, on selling virtually. Well, I, you're going back to Zig stuff from probably 1970, 1980 and going, here you go, have a read of this. They don't want to tell them from yeah. that, but if you actually just took the content out and yeah. said, this is what you should do when you're on the Zoom call, the, you know, the Teams call, the WebEx, whatever you're running, start it like this, do this. It's fun. The middle of fun. It's, it's the way we connect, isn't it? As, uh, as humans, we want to have that connection. And you set the tone, which I think was where Zig was coming from to we set the tone in, in how we're going to do it. I really like that. Really like that Absolutely. point. Absolutely. What are you seeing um, good leaders doing during COVID, Tim? Some of your clients, what are you seeing some, the, the good ones doing? Yeah, you know, um, that is such a great uh, question. In fact, I've got, a, I've got a client that I respect uh, so much that I worked with for about, I think I worked for about 16 months at pre-COVID, and now I'm working with several of, of the team since COVID. And some of the key things that I've learned from this leader is um, I'm, I'm going to share like five things. And you mentioned one of them earlier is you mentioned listening. I'll come back to that in a second. I think one of the critical things that I'm learning from uh, this, this company that happens to be in the mortgage business is the first thing is he said, culture's created. So live what you expect even in the midst of challenging times. He said, culture is a language, belief, and values. So everything they're doing in the midst of the crisis, he has to com continually communicate the values. And in fact, he said, we hire for values, hire for values, and then be transparent about it, and then train for skill. So they are still working to develop talent in the midst of the challenges that they're going through. And just to give you, just to give you an example here, this was about a $500 million company with 120 employers until March 30th. And they, they had to release 50% of their workforce. Um, and they're in the mortgage lending and industry. So it was critical for them to make sure that they continued to communicate those values and instill and do ongoing training. So the second thing he shared with me and what I'm seeing is that uh, he said, we have to identify and protect our priorities. So what, are, what is the most important thing that impacts our business? And we're gonna make sure that we put the majority of our attention to that. You've heard the 80-20 rule, right? If yeah. we put 80% of our attention to the 20% that's getting us the best results, we're communicating that throughout the organization and we're all on board, right? We're all on, we're all on board and we're communicating frequently that our odds of making it through this is, is going to be, um, is going to be better. And then he said, it's critical that in challenging times, the people that you do have on your team, they need to be in, al in alignment with you, right? right? You can't afford to have, you can't afford to have people that aren't in alignment with you. So it, 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 and the only way you find that out is if you're asking those questions, Hey, what am I, what am I missing? How are you doing? How can I help you as a leader? So I'm seeing that. 
And the other thing so, I'm So that's I'm the constant seeing, communication part you were talking about too. So it's not just yeah. once. It, it's, it, I think it's consistent communication too. I think that's a really good point. I'm seeing leaders on my side, they're, they're communicating frequently, but they're also consistent. And I think that helps the alignment as well with people because not everyone gets it straight away. Sometimes leaders get it and they don't, they think that people get it straight away, but sometimes their leaders need a little more. They need to just communicate over and over consistently to get that message through. They do. And it's important leaders. And he shared this with me too, is everyone's watching. He said, everyone is watching yes. every day. What you're doing as a leader, he said at the end of the day, he said, it's 80% comes from my actions and 20% from words. So again, for him as a leader, it's important that they see him during the challenging times too. So I heard Patrick Lencioni say this about four months ago, kind of at the beginning of this, is that people need, they, they, pe people need your voice, not your words. And what he's saying is emails, texts, okay, that's great. But right now they need your words. So get with them visually so they can see mm -hmm. your words, they can hear your words, and they can connect with you visually in your eyes, right? Because yeah. when you're dealing over the phone all the time, people can say one thing and you don't know how they're taking it. So it's important. He said, as, as a leader, actions are important. And then the last thing he said, which I thought was brilliant, is know your role and then get out of the way. So he said, as a leader, yeah. for me and my company right now, it's important for the team to know, bring me in when you need me. Yeah. But I'm putting my, I'm putting my faith in this team. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You have to lay the vision, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have to say, listen, bring me in where you need me because yeah. I want you to make the decisions that you should be making for the role that you're in. I don't want to be doing it for you. Right. Yes. So know your yeah. role and then get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Love that. That's That's fantastic. Um, and I think the other thing I've seen um, from leaders is just the, the really, the best ones who pivoted for me, the ones who moved quickly, they went, they went all in on their people skills. So I, I don't know about you, Tim, but I've done a lot of disc through uh, this COVID with those particular clients. So anyone that hadn't done it, they got onto it. They invested in it. They just, they, hey, we're, we're, we're going remote. We're going to understand our people even more. Like we're going to really understand the disc styles of our people, our behavioral styles, who we're going to need to spend more time with, who's going to be actually really happy working from home. And I can pretty much get out of their way, as you mentioned. Others are going to need a lot more love. Um, and it's, it's no wrong or right. It's just how it is. Um, but that was something I noticed. Have you picked up and done, done behavioral assessments and things like that over COVID? I do a lot of that. In fact, right before this call, I just did a debrief with a company's front office, um, uh, the, the, the greeters. And one of the things that I'm seeing, and I'm actually encouraging all organizations to do, your frontline people, the people that are the face of the organization, they need to understand how to connect with people better today than they did six months ago. They need to be attractors. And I say it like this. Everyone that walks through your door, everyone that picks up the phone and calls you, you're either selling them in or out that they made the right decision picking up the phone and calling you, stepping in the business, opening that door to come in and acquire whatever you might have. Every day, you're selling them in or out. And the more you can understand human behavior, research shows those that understand human behavior are more successful. So yes, I've been leaning into that and I believe that is the wave. That is the wave of the future because, you know, in this virtual environment, I even thought, hey, after six months, we're going to be back live and, right. you know, virtual is not going to be, it's been around for a long time, but it's not going to be as much. Hey, virtually is the wave of the future. Virtual conferences, virtual meetings. I've got clients that are even looking at, hey, we may not go back in our building because we're able to effectively operate just as well without the expense of the big commercial building. So it's important to understand how to connect to people quickly and disc assessments are, it's, it, it's incredible how quickly people, they, they learn it, then they start living it and then they start yeah. leading it, right? Yeah. <laughs> With other people. So I love it. that. 
it's, uh, it's, it's really working well. And I think that's the same thing. Now, you were telling me just in the side that we're in stage four lockdown in Victoria, where I am with you uh, here. But with you, you were saying to me in, in Austin, you guys don't go back to the CBD buildings uh, like it's December or something like that. Is that right? Is, is a lockdown so in Austin, then? yeah. Yeah, in Austin, there's a stay at home, work at home until December 15th. Now you wow. can you can meet in, you know, small groups, but my wife and I also operate a children's musical theater here in Austin and we hold classes. Well, class size is limited to 10 with the teacher. So where we would normally have 25 to 30, you know, you can have nine, but all the protocols around that. So yeah, yeah, um, well, yeah it's, it's um... going to be some time. I think we would love that. We're, we're, we're down here, which is uh, we can only have one, one person go shopping a day. We can't move out of a 5K radius. And, and, and in fact, what's interesting is that uh, you talk about that, those businesses, those CBDs. Yesterday's uh, Australian Financial Review, which is like the Wall Street Journal, there's, there's um, all the real estate, commercial real estate trusts, the CEOs of these big trusts and who own these big commercial buildings are begging CEOs to model the way and go back in, right? please go back in and get back in your CBD yep. offices and get the economy going. And I think on one hand, I kind of get that. But if I was the CEO, what I'm also seeing is exactly your point before. Hang on a second here. I'm really productive. In fact, I'm more productive with a whole lot of functions working from home. So yes, there's going to be some people will need to go back to the office, but there's a whole bunch of things that I don't necessarily need to have an office for anymore. So am I going to take the 10 floors again? I don't think so. I'm maybe going to take two. I may yeah. take three and make them a more creative space. But I yeah. think this is what, you know, if you're a CEO, you're working out now, what do I actually need? If I've got a commercial lease coming up, I'm really evaluating. Um, and I just got some research in from um, on, on uh, US sales teams. And one of the number one thing US chief sales officers, um, COOs are looking at is the structure of my professional sales team going forward how much is going to be field sales how much is going to be out of inbound versus outbound how much can we take virtually how much can we turn into a how many people have we got on who are sales people who are in fact order takers and in fact the e-commerce engine can actually do it more efficiently then you know and just this whole structure oh, yeah. uh, it's a really i'm sure your clients i've got a few of mine who are now looking at that and asking for actually what, what do you think we should do here and how should we structure? It's a work in progress, but I think that that's, so I don't think people are going to be rushing back to the big buildings and signing leases because there's just so much stuff to talk about first. Are you seeing the similar no, thing? I, I'm seeing so much of that uh, with clients, right? I do a lot of business now. I do a lot of business in the auto industry. I grew up in the car business and it's just interesting how, how even a lot of my business is auto dealers, right? So in that industry, I don't see a lot of that changing. Now, what we do see is a lot of people buying cars online and they're, <laughs> they're picking cars up like they would groceries. They drive up, yes. they get the keys to their new car and all yep. the paperwork's handled online, all the negotiation, right? So I don't see car dealers in that industry, it impacting it. But for these other big organizations that that had large offices with multi people in cubicles i see a lot of that downsizing from my perspective yeah and even on the auto side you start to see that now where um one of the big dealerships i work with one of the german prestige brands put it that way once they are they're actually removing um the the new the new salesperson role they don't need it anymore because you're shopping online uh, but what is rising is the rise of the auto finance person, right? So oh, you yeah. need to, so I, okay, I, I know it's that kind of car. It's this, this model, it's that color right now. What are my options for funding it? That's, that's really the person you want to talk to, you know, cause you kind of right. know what it is. Just, I've ticked all the boxes there and I want to pick it up on Wednesday, but how am I going to fund it? And so we're, I'm seeing a bit of a shift to even some of the savvier, um, uh, and by savvy, I mean professional uh, new car sales guys uh, are actually moving into finance, getting finance backgrounds, getting finance degrees, kind of moving into how to actually, you know, talk about funding it over X amount and chattel mortgages and all that kind of stuff. Is that, is that similar, something similar for you? Because you guys have got a bit yeah. different the way you do auto, but. Very similar, very similar here. I think you're right on target and not, not surprised with the uh, restructuring and really thinking through for the future, what's the best way to set up your sales teams. And what have you done uh, in your own practice, Tim? I mean, you're a, you're a leadership consultant we've spoken about and, and we, we've talked about our clients pivoting. Um, what, what have you done through COVID? Because as you realize it's going to become, become, become more virtual, just you know, what's some stuff that Tim Novak's done? 
Yeah. So great question. And all of my uh, speaking engagements were put on hold. And one of the things I've done in the last year is I started working with the PGA of America about a year and a half ago. And that side of my business was really ramping up and speaking at local resorts and, and golf clubs all over the area. Well, with COVID, everything's outside playing. They're playing golf, but they're not, they haven't been doing anything indoors. So right. all of my speaking stuff is on hold. But what I found is the training moved virtually and, and pretty easy. Now I'll say pretty easy because there's still some clients that I've had to really work to not tell, but to help them understand how we can impact people virtually the same as we could live. And, and, I, and I say this, uh, it's one thing to tell them, but it's another thing to get them to buy in to the impact for the investment because they think that live where they have you in a room and if they want to ask questions, they've got a court with you. I've got a, I've got a dental office that has 15 <laughs> associates and <laughs> I meet with them about once a quarter and do a two hour workshop with them. Well, the owner has been very hesitant unless we were live, right? Well, in the, in the environment we're in, we can't do that. So for me, it's been more of, okay, here's what we can do. Here's the kind of impact. And from my perspective, it might give us an opportunity to even get deeper with them, being virtual, putting them in individual groups in a separate room than we could if we were together in one room together. So for me, it hasn't, it's almost been coaching them and mentoring them into it rather than telling them, hey, we'll do it virtual. Here's what we'll do. Here's how many days a week we'll do it, this type of thing. And, and I think that's important for people that are in this industry to understand is that just because they tell someone, hey, I can do it just effective virtually, unless you really help them understand and again, walk them through it, you can't tell them what you're going to do and expect them to think it's going to be the same impact. So that's kind of what yeah. I'm seeing. So I've been, I've been actually promoting more of that like starting a speaker's club instead of doing it live. Let's do it virtually. Okay. It's going to be the same. It's going to be better virtually because I'm going to work harder to make them stand up their posture, use a microphone, have everything they would have live yeah, and have individuals give them more feedback than they would if we were live. So again, that's kind of how I've pivoted my business to be, to be really selling them, but walking right. them through the process mm. to understand. <laughs> yeah. But what it means you... for your business is, uh, and, and mine as well, um, is that the sales cycle is longer because it's, you, you, and I think it's a really great point you made. There's no point telling them, um, hey, I can do it virtually. I'm accredited virtually. You know, I'm awesome virtually. Um, you, you know, and, and that all may be true, right? And it is true, but have they really bought into can they pass it on? You know, we talked about that earlier and I see that a lot of times and you know, I've, I've made that mistake many times thinking that I'm selling to someone like I'm selling to you. But what I forget is that that's only part one of part two, sorry, part one of a two part sell, which is that person then going to sell it to their stakeholders. And that might be a leader convincing his team. Actually, you know, we're going to do some stuff with Tim and Rob. Uh, it's going to be virtual. Oh, you know, is he good enough or she good enough to sell what we've just told them? about how good it is. And I think for me, actually, one of the things that's, you know, COVID has been an interesting thing. One of the things that's really worked for me from a workshop point of view is actually moving from the, a one day workshop to doing it over four sessions or three sessions over three weeks, because I, I, I going to be honest with you. Um, I honestly believe the embedment, the adoption, the understanding of the principles over the three week, is just so much stronger. They're able to come back and go, hey, Rob, we tried that. That worked, that didn't work. Or I can go to go out and do this. Next week, we're going to do that. Watch this video during the week. Have a look at that. Come back. Now, I just feel the, the real adoption, the embedding, rather than the kind of sugar hit of the half day, one day, which is fun. I love doing them. You love doing them as well. And uh, they're great. But, but yeah, I love that extra bit. And I think even if we do go back to doing more live, I really think um, I'm going to really... I'm just pushing for a lot more touch points post those sessions, like really, really building those in. I really believe in them now. 
No, I love that uh, thinking you've got. I believe that's actually a competitive advantage that someone in our role can offer to people. I've talked to a lot of people that said, oh my gosh, my VP really loves these one week boot camps, or they love these yeah. three day intense boot camps." And then I asked the question, okay, so tell me what you have going today that you've applied from attending those boot camps, and not telling them, but saying, okay, here's, here, here's how this program would work. We're going to teach a lesson. You've got a week to apply. And then we'll come back and talk about implementation and results. And then we'll take the next lesson and yeah. taking them through that. And now I've, I've seen that happen too. Right. And sometimes it actually goes longer because what you're getting to, you would have never got to in a two day, three day intensive thing because you've run up against some boulders mm. that need to be addressed that are specific to their company. So what I found is that, more organizations I'm working with have improved their playbooks, their processes from going through a more intense over time. And they look at the investment and go, hold it. I'm getting more because it wasn't over in three days. That's right. And there's more touch points with you. And right. you can reflect as a leader, as, you know, as, a, as a facilitator, workshop leader, whatever way you want to call it, as a consultant, you kind of get, because it's one of the things that's challenging for us is to get inside their business really fast. I mean, one of the things we're good at uh, is, is, is being able to cross industries and get deep real fast. Um, but we can get deep real fast. Um, and sometimes we get deep real fast at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I've got, I got these ideas for them. Whereas I now find that over a two or three week period or three months, sometimes these engagements have turned out to be, you're almost part of the team. Like you're, you're actually on board and you feel, and many times now I'm punching out something to a leader and saying, you know what? I was just thinking about you guys the other day. I saw this in the paper. I heard this bit over here. I want, are you guys looking at that? And, and that's, that's you're just adding value. And I, you know, you, know, you and I know that we, we love people, mm -hmm. people of value adding value. Uh, and I think you can do that more over these over just putting it over three or four weeks as opposed to the, the kind of one day so i think out of COVID, we get, we're, we're all looking from a customer perspective from a consultant perspective at how do we do learning better uh yeah. and there's nothing like the live experience you you've played you've played live rock and roll tim so you don't need to convince, to convince you of the live experience in the moment but i do think we're going to have a hybrid whatever happens going going forward yeah no i, I love that thought and i would I, just share with you as well as I think the first time a major contract finished with me, you know, I was kind of thinking, oh man, this is over. It's done. It's man, I hate to lose this. And what I found was that it wasn't over. Those clients I made, all that work that I did, it has extended on in some way, some capacity. And I would challenge everyone that's in this line of work, use those people to give you testimonials today. Because if you can even get them on Zoom, if you can get a recording, if you can get some shots of you doing something and put it into a short testimonial video to help promote what you're doing, that's going to make a big impact on people. Because again, they don't just need your, vo your, your words. They need your voice. They need to see who you are and what you do. So I yeah. love... I, I just love that. Hey, yeah, we're uh, we're almost out of time, Tim. But I got a question for you, and I'm, I'm I've got this question. I'm now you, as we think about how we started this podcast. I'm going to ask you this question anyway because I'm really interested in the answer. Uh, if you had to go back in time and talk to 16 year old Tim Novak, what would you tell him? Dude, I would have said first of all, don't sell those expensive guitars you've got. 56 Stratocaster, oh my God. 55, 55 Black Beauty Les Paul. Don't do that or sell I would your tell you sports that. cars that you think you need the money for today. Don't do that. I would. That's what I would tell myself. <laughs> oh my God, that is so true. And we've all done it, haven't we? We've all we've all done it at a time. You know, we can only do what we can do with the information we have, I think. And sometimes you, you've got to also be kind to yourself as well and go, you know what, at the, when I made that decision, at, I thought it through and it was the best yeah. thing. But, you know, in hindsight, <laughs> as it's quadrupled in price, as it's oh X10 by price, uh, oh. you know, and I really enjoyed it. Now I can't find them anywhere. I'm on my quest. Uh, it's yep. the great... Um, I just, uh, I, I, funnily enough, you should, it's funny you should say that I just sold a motorcycle of mine I, and I wasn't riding it very much and I, I was charging the battery more time than I was doing anything else anyway, but, but I was really, really happy and just someone said to me, well, you're sad to see it go and it was a, a Ducati and I said, no, no, it wasn't because it went to a guy 
who uh, had crashed his when he was um, about 30 and he'd waited 22 years to find the, the same bike. And that's what I had. And it was exact. and it was, mine had done very little kilometers and he, he never, he couldn't afford to fix it back then. He kind of rode it off and that was the end of it. And he'd really been in the back of his mind. He'd been watching and searching and searching and he, and he came around and he, it was exactly what he had, exactly the same model. Oh. Uh, and he bought it and, I, and I'm totally excited for him because it was something he'd waited so long and he now had the money to do it. He's got a very successful business now, but it was just exciting. But it's, 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 you know, but he, it was great to see that happen, isn't it? So sometimes I love That's... the fact of passing stuff on. It doesn't worry me selling it. It was a great bike. Oh, I had yeah. fun. He's going to have way more fun. It means so much to him. Total different feeling. And I can, I can just see the joy in your, <laughs> and hear the joy in your voice, just saying that, knowing that, okay, I'm totally cool with that. But, oh, some of those other goofy decisions I made, what yeah, was I thinking? Right. Yeah. Where was yeah. my mentor then? Yeah, that's right. Where were you, people? <laughs> Where <laughs> were you? Back? No one was stopping exactly. me selling that damn thing. Hey, now, Tim, it's been fantastic having you on board. Uh, uh, how can people find out more about you? What's the, what's the website for, for Tim Novak? How can people hey, contact you? Pretty easy. TimNovak.com. Tim Novak, N O V A K.com. And that takes you to everything you want to know about Tim Novak. <laughs> That's it. Fantastic. And you're on LinkedIn, of course. Everything's there for what you've got and all the good stuff. Well, look, people, I know your clients uh, rave about you and, uh, and love what you do. And I've always found you as a great mentor and someone I could reach out to and uh, always, always willing to help the fact that we're on completely different time zones and we catch up. You know, at best, once a year, probably going to be a little bit uh, further away for this, for this time. But down the same token, Tim, without COVID, we probably would have maybe put this off for a little bit longer. And so I, I'm, I'm excited that you're able to, uh, to uh, help us here on the Out of the Possible podcast been totally awesome being with you and uh best of luck and let's catch up uh, very soon oh it's been my pleasure my best to you rob thanks for having me hey thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed this episode please subscribe and rate the podcast you listen to so we can continue to serve and inspire others remember connect to us on all the social media channels the out of the possible podcast is hosted by me rob hartnett and produced by finn hartnett connect with us directly on linkedin rob hyphen Hartnett, H-A-R-T-N-E-T-T, and Finn Hartnett. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.